Eh, buenas tardes, eh, muchísimas gracias por acompañarnos en esta, en esta actividad que es múltiple porque ocurren tres cosas. Eh, presentamos este libro, que es un libro que compila cinco ensayos de Annalie Davis, que es parte de la serie de escrituras locales, posiciones críticas de América Central, el Caribe y sus, y sus diásporas, que es una serie dedicada a, a, a compilar... Eh, los escritos eh, y las posiciones eh, teóricas, reflexivas más relevantes de Centroamérica y del Caribe de los últimos 30, 40 años. Es una serie que está comenzando y, y Analí, este libro es el primero de una autora del Caribe anglófono, lo cual es muy importante para nosotros también porque nos permite expandir la, la idea y el vínculo que tenemos con el Caribe, que es habitualmente con el Caribe hispano. Eh, Así que estamos muy contentos de poder presentar este libro que ya está circulando. Al mismo tiempo, eh, lo que le pedía a Ali en este marco era que nos introduzca al trabajo que ella ha venido haciendo en el Caribe, que es un trabajo impresionante, realmente muy, muy relevante, en, en tanto ha venido transformando las maneras de pensar, producir, narrar eh, el arte contemporáneo en la región. Quizá un momento significativo dentro de su trayectoria, que es híbrida, que es tanto una artista como una activista cultural, una curadora, una escritora. Quizá un momento importante de su trabajo como activista y como gestora y como curadora fue la exposición Stip, eh, Stick Lips and Marks, eh, que fue una exposición que se realizó a, a mitad, a fines de los 90, en realidad en el año 97, 97, 98, right? Yeah, yeah. 97, 98, que fue la primera exposición conscientemente feminista de artistas del Caribe uh -huh. y que fue una muestra además bastante polémica, ¿no? Y parte de esa polémica y de esa controversia está reunida en esta conversación que tenemos al final del libro, cada uno de esos libros viene con una entrevista y en esta conversación que tenemos a Nali y yo un poco desmenuzamos lo que significa esa controversia y cómo también hay una estructura patriarcal y misógina que permite ¿no? que, que, que un proyecto de esta naturaleza tenga una suerte de, eh, ¿cómo se puede decir?, de ataque, ¿no? que, que fuera como un blanco, digamos, ¿no? de muchos críticos hombres y de la gran crítica, digamos. Eh, así que, bueno, Annalí, desde ese proyecto a, a mitad, a fines de los años 90, hasta ahora ha venido organizando proyectos, plataformas, espacios, y básicamente generando excusas para que las artistas y los artistas puedan encontrarse y pensar sobre su propio contexto e imaginar maneras de transformarlo. Eh, ella lo, lo, va, lo va a decir con más detalles, pero creo que la iniciativa más importante de los últimos años es Tilting Axis, que es una plataforma itinerante que es hoy por hoy la, el encuentro más numeroso de agentes de todo el Caribe, que se reúne en una, en una ciudad distinta, en una isla distinta cada año, la primera edición fue en Barbados, en Fresh Mill, que es el espacio que Annalie eh, fundó hace cinco años atrás. La segunda edición fue en Miami, la tercera fue en las Islas Gran Caimán, que yo tuve la oportunidad de, de visitar. La cuarta edición fue en, en República Dominicana, el año pasado, que también estuve. Este año ocurrió en la, las Islas de Guadalupe y el próximo va a ocurrir en, en Bahamas. Eh, entonces realmente se ha convertido como en un espacio que está generando y dinamizando de una manera impresionante y está permitiendo empoderar lo local, que es algo fundamental. ¿no? Y al mismo tiempo estamos eh, inaugurando una exposición de dibujos recientes de Annalie Davis, que es una, que es una serie eh, muy poderosa, eh, que tenemos de hecho el, el, el la suerte de incluso estrenar una serie nueva dentro de ese conjunto de dibujos, ella lo va a comentar mejor. Eh, la, la exposición se titula Hard Seed, eh, que se podría traducir como semilla de corazón, eh, y hay, hay como cuatro series reunidas en ese conjunto de dibujos y las que yo le decía que es un estreno es la serie Second Spring, Segunda Primavera, que, que explora la, la experiencia de la dimensión postreproductiva del cuerpo de la mujer y su relación con discursos patriarcales y la memoria colonial de las plantaciones caribeñas. Es un trabajo que Analia ha venido realizando en los últimos años y la verdad es que es una suerte poder mostrarlo aquí. Así que, eh, como parte de contextualizar el libro y contextualizar la muestra, le pedí a Nali que haga esta charla que se titula Amando los paisajes difíciles, arte y activismo cultural en el contexto caribeño, que de alguna manera eh, nos permite atravesar su itinerario creativo e intelectual. La charla es en inglés, así que si alguno tuviera un problema con la traducción, eh, Lola, que está aquí al lado, puede ayudar. Así que si alguien necesita, Lola se puede sentar a su lado a ayudar 
con la traducción. ¿Hay alguien en particular que necesite traducción o ayuda con la traducción? ¿Todo bien? Bueno, si en cualquier momento igual necesitan, aquí está Lola. Así que bueno. También hay café. Y voy a entonces pasar el micro a Nali para que comience su presentación y luego de ello vamos a poder conversar un poco con ella y luego pasar a ver la exposición. Muchísimas gracias, Nali, por tenerte aquí. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miguel. Um, first, I have to apologize for presenting in English, <laughs> but thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Um, it's such a privilege for me to be here at Tiaratica and to see Virginia's labor continue to bear fruit and to recognize the care with which this space is being nurtured. I had the privilege of meeting Virginia in Trinidad in 2007 at the Caribbean Contemporary Art Space for one of the research meetings that led to the Caribbean Crossroads of the World Exhibition in New York. So it feels very special to be here in the space that she gave birth to and which continues to flourish in such important ways not least of which is the commitment to this 20th anniversary series of publications. Virginia was unique from her perspective in Central America in terms of her interest in the Anglophone Caribbean, and my being here in part is a result of her curiosity and research for which I'm grateful. And I just want to thank Miguel also for inviting me to share my words as part of this local writing series and for the opportunity to exhibit my work and to share my hybrid practice uh, with you here this afternoon. And of course, thank you to the entire Tiaretico team for welcoming me so warmly and for their genuine hospitality, something that's increasingly rare at this moment. Um, and I don't take it for granted. So thank you. Um, So I wanted to just create a context for the uh, space out of which I come. Uh, since being here, I've been interested to figure out um, what makes, if there's something that makes people in Costa Rica identify as Caribbean. And I was curious if anybody here identifies as Caribbean, because there's you know, a huge, uh, obviously a, a huge migration from some Caribbean spaces. So we often talk about you know, how to define the Caribbean. Um, So in terms of where I come from, Barbados is situated, um, it's the far eastern island in this necklace of islands. It's part of the Anglophone Caribbean, formerly the British West Indies. It's now part of CARICOM, which is an economic zone similar to the European Union. The region is complicated. It also includes the Hispanic Caribbean with independent countries, Cuba and the Dominican Republic. The Francophone Caribbean, which includes independent Haiti and other islands that are overseas departments of France. The Netherlands Antilles or the Dutch speaking Caribbean, which includes the independent Suriname and the Dutch islands that are part of the Netherlands. Then there's a US Caribbean that includes Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands, both dependencies of the US. And there's the Circum Caribbean, which includes includes Costa Rica and the other countries on the rim of Central America. So this afternoon, the goal of the presentation is to create a historical context for my work, to share my art practice, and to speak a little bit about my work as a cultural activist in Barbados and the wider Caribbean. The focus of my research is the sugarcane plantation as an economic model that has shaped Barbados and the wider Caribbean and the foundation from which my practice emerges. Uh, this image is the site of my home and studio. It's currently a working dairy farm that was originally operational as a 17th century sugar plantation. Uh, Miguel, I wonder, should we turn the light off? Um, so the, the building with the long roof to the far right is the barn where the cows are. Um, my house is to the left and the studio is under that grove of trees. Uh, this is an, an old windmill. It was a, um, a technology that was brought to Barbados by religious Jews from Brazil fleeing uh, persecution. The property was acquired by my great-grandmother um, uh, and has been in the family for about 100 years. About 30 years ago, it was taken out of sugar and transformed to a dairy farm, which is run by my brother. Barbados is a very small landmass. It's 21 miles by 14. It is the place where England began its experimentation in tropical agriculture in the early 17th century. 
By the late 17th century, this very small place was referred to as the richest spot of ground in the entire world. It is the only Caribbean colony that was colonized exclusively by a single colonial power and was in part a penal colony where convicts and undesirables were sent to. It has been continually charted since the early 17th century, initially by European cartographers as part of their colonizing expeditions to the West Indies. The sugar revolution is the economic phenomenon that transformed Barbados forever. Um, we lost almost our entire biodiversity by the third quarter of the 17th century. Um, and this expansive deforestation gave way to a kind of a carefully controlled garden-like environment with these neatly furrowed fields and um, on the sugarcane plantations. Uh, this is what fueled Britain's economic growth and transformation into a modern society. This image is taken at the West Indies Central Sugarcane Breeding Station, which is a very important space. It's one of the two oldest in the world with a continuous breeding program since the 19th century. Uh, this is the site of my studio. So my practice is concerned with history, uh, particularly it considers the historical can contaminations that have been traumatically inscribed into the landscape, layering topographies that consider the Caribbean as a site of disease, the long worms of history, the degradation of soil, the loss of biodiversity, and the mastering of the landscape via monoculture, sugar, and then tourism. So drawing is the tool that allows me to function as another kind of cartographer, contemplating this tangled terrain in multiple ways. The act of tracing lines on paper allows me to recognize my feelings about this land, initially informed by innocent childhood experiences and the deep love I have for its beauty, while allowing for conflicting understandings of what took place, including historical violence and segregation. So this is the bookkeeper's office at a plantation on the island where I grew up. Uh, this is the archive that I stole years later after we left. I uh, went into the building and found all of these ledger pages with frogs and lizards all over them. And I threw them two stories out the window, put them into the car, and decided that this would become this sort of substrate for my work for the last number of years. And these are the ledger pages from the 70s and 80s. Um, everything was accounted for here. So this included wages, field activity, uh, labor gangs, rent rolls, the measuring of rainfall. Everything was ordered in these ledger pages. And so for me, this act of drawing functions like a kind of a processing system, which allows me to reckon with the chaos of history it links the harsh transformation of the landscape with imperialism. And the past continually echoes or infects the production of another kind of archive where I can express intuitive feelings, apprehensions, and anxieties rather than reflecting the economic parameters with which we have been defined. So this was the beginning of quite a large drawing. Um, uh, it's pushing back the idea of these kind of fiscal renderings on these ledger pages. Um, this is the ledger page that the British Empire would have used globally. Uh, it underpinned there the expansion of the empire. Um, and so what I'm looking at is this alternate kind of cartography. Um, here is the drawing of something called Queen Anne's Lace. It's a crochet pattern. It references women's labor or domesticity. Um, it's also talking about interlaced um, or interlocked histories, as well as the gaps in our understanding of our history. Beside it is a drawing of a sugarcane ratoon plant with this kind of exaggerated rhizomatic structure. And the two forms are renegotiating uh, their relationship to each other and reaching out to each other. And it's inspired by Edward Glissant's um, theories about rhizomatic thinking. Uh, he speaks about how the root is not, um, the identity is not solely within the root, but that our identities become more alive when we're in relationship with one another. Um, 
This is actually a portrait of my parents. My father was a farmer and um, uh, my mother had been crocheting this particular piece of Queen Anne's lace for a very long time. Um, these are, some of these drawings are on show across the road at Tiaratica, but again it's this attempt at using the plantation ledger page, which becomes a kind of a palimpsest, this sort of layered uh, meanings um, and the idea of pushing a back against uh, an economic rendering of who we are. Uh, this is from a solo exhibition in Texas in 2016. Uh, I walk the fields on a very regular basis almost every day and I come across a lot of these wild plants. Um, they are considered very unimportant. With the death of the sugar industry, um, a lot of the lands are sprouting these wild plants that have been dormant for centuries and they feel to me like there's this quiet revolution happening in the fields. These dormant seeds centuries later are asserting themselves, they're ignoring the boundaries of the plantation and um, it, it, in part my work as an artist and an activist is inspired by the idea of phytoremediation. It's a scientific process by which uh, some plants have the capacity to absorb toxins through its root system. And so I see that this is a natural kind of healing that's happening in the fields, um, uh, you know, and contributing to more uh, plant diversity. So there's the collection and the drying and the drawing of these plants that sit on the ledger page. So there's this countering of a daily logging of economic activity and this consistent pressure to be productive and accountable in economic terms. So these then um, in contradictory ways are seen as things that have no value. In actual fact, um, these are plants that are a virtual apothecary. These are plants that were used by the enslaved Africans as a medicine cabinet. Uh, it would have been used for bush teas, for bush baths, for, um, for healing, for terminating unwanted pregnancies. Um, and so the idea here is to um, think about the, of these plants and their kind of proliferation now with the, the death of the sugar industry um, as a way to push back against the trauma and the violence and this notion of trying to reconcile with the land and the virtual slaughterhouse that sits below the fields. The series is called Francis. It is, um, Francis was named in the last will and testament of uh, Thomas Applewhite in 1815. Um, he referred to her as his favorite girl slave. And when I read that, it sort of struck me that he could put these words together and it really suggested a level of cognitive dissonance. How could you consider your slave as a favorite person? She is the person that he spoke about the most in his will. And uh, he said um, that he directed that six years after his death, his little favorite girl slave named Frances shall be manumitted and set free from all and all manner of servitude and slavery whatsoever. He was the owner of the place where I now live and work. And so I'm drawing a line from that moment till now. Um, and the drawing of her name is with these um, 17th and 18th century shards. So her name, uh, the letters of her name are formed by the drawing of these shards that I find in the fields when I walk uh, through the former sugarcane fields and it speaks about the fragmentary nature of our understanding of, of, of people like her, the enslaved women who worked on the plantations because the voice that we have is typically the voice of the white male planter through the wills and the conveyances and the deeds. So this is an attempt to um, acknowledge the presence of people who we have very little information about and can't track because most of them don't have surnames. Um, so this was the first drawing in a more recent series about parasites. Um, it's inspired by the brilliant Cuban essayist Antonio Benitez Rojo. He wrote a classic 
a book called The Repeating Island, and it's very much about the plantation and how that model ricocheted throughout the Caribbean. Uh, he's writing about the parasitical presence of the island's sugar-producing history in the context of Cuba. And I just wanted to read a, a quote. If there exists something that's true and can be called history, as you can see, it was not an epic or coherent system that kept unfolding itself in spirals towards utopia. In reality, it was nothing but a long annelid parasite that we carried in our bowels and that stole food from us. The great thief orders a public report in order to know what he can take from each. And so this piece makes me think again about Edouard Glissant who speaks about the right to opacity. So there's this sense uh, that we have to be entirely transparent. But he, so this is what the Ledger page is attempting to do, right? It's attempting to uh, log every single thing, measure every single thing. And Glissant speaks about our right as people from the global south to be opaque. Um, and so here is an image of a woman who is confronting uh, this, this parasite of history. Uh, so this is in the exhibition across the road, uh, but it prefaces these larger drawings, which are about, I don't think in centimeters, but they're about seven feet across. So 170 centimeters. So they're larger scale drawings and uh, here is this woman looking suspiciously at these writhing annelids, annelid parasites. Uh, the text above her head is taken from a 1966 la land and soil survey of Barbados. Uh, again, this was done by the Imperial um, Agriculture University uh, in an attempt to measure every square inch of soil on the island so they would understand how to effectively control that land mass for the imposition, the successful imposition of the sugar crane monocrop. And, and these uh, writhing parasites are coming out of this kind of limestone base. So Barbados is this limestone uh, island. Importantly, the woman is wearing, uh, a, her body is comprised of the Queen Anne's lace, so this crocheted pattern that speaks about um, interconnectivity, and in her body she's wearing a, a bush tea dress, and this is a Circe bush plant which is used to expel parasites. Uh, so she's protecting herself. And there's a whole series of these. I'm just showing two of the drawings here. She is uh, standing on the edge of a mill wall and she's expurgating or expelling this parasite uh, in an attempt to uh, rid herself of this kind of historical contaminant uh, and the unrelenting spread of its infectious disease. And again, the uh, image underneath is taken from this land and soil survey, but it's in uh, specifically referring to the land where uh, the site I live on is located. So everything in my work is about the plantation, so there are many ways of trying to unpack it. Uh, Unearthing Voices is an interdisciplinary project that links archaeology, history, and art practice. I have been collaborating for a number of years with archaeologists from the UK and the United States, and every year we have these summer field sessions where archaeology students come and we're trying to find the site of an enslaved village, which is an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. So the site where I am is now 142 acres. It, 20 acres. It used to be just over 300 acres, which means that the enslaved village could be some off the land that our family currently owns. Um, but the idea is to try and find this site so that we can continue to tell a more complete story about this space. And these are examples of some of the things that I find when I walk. So these are from the late 17 and early 1800s. They're everywhere everywhere that you go in Barbados and the Caribbean. These things are there if you can find them. They are cheap crockery sets that came in from the UK. And then the red clay would have been used, um, made by the enslaved using red clay in Barbados. And I just, I just brought a few here. Um, 
just this summer, we were actually able to find, this is actually an indigenous artifact. Um, and this was great for us to find because we are an, an inland site and I thought most of the indigenous people lived on the coast. So this extends the story of the site uh, to before the period of enslavement. And so as I collect these, um, these pieces, I was commissioned by a London-based curatorial team called Cooking Sections for a project called the Empire Remain Shop to produce a work. And so I produced this piece called Bushti Services. And it recognizes the relationship between Barbados and Britain. It recognizes tea as the second most drunk beverage um, in, in Britain. And what I did instead was I worked with a local potter, Hamilton Wiltshire, and we collaborated on producing this tea service that rather than being made from porcelain, it was made by local clay. But I intervened these 17th and 18th century shards um, into the tea service. Um, and then I would make bush tea that was made from the wild plants that I would gather on the fields. And so it's a discursive, performative work and a gesture of hospitality. It's a small act of reparation. So I went to the UK, I served tea, and I would engage in this conversation. So rather than serving what the 18th century abolitionist Robert Southey called a blood-sweetened beverage, because of course, you know, tea was grown on plantations in the East and it was sweetened by sugar from plantations in the West Indies, I offer, in contradiction to that, a, a healing uh, bush tea um, for fellow drinkers to engage in conversation about transatlantic relations. And uh, maybe unsurprisingly, most of the people I served tea to had no idea what I was talking about in London. And I would say, but I have known you for 300 years. How do you not know who I am? I actually modernized you. <laughs> Your cities are built on the back of our labor. Uh, um, this is the uh, Circe, one of the plants that made the, the bush tea. Again, it's used for parasitic worms, for eczema. It has detoxifying properties. Uh, this was the pop-up shop. It's actually in a former bank on Baker Street in London, so it was a perfect location for this piece. So people would sign up uh, for the tea service, and you know, I would serve tea, which would, um, you know, we would then have this, this conversation and of course, it's an imperfect tea set, uh, so it would drip and leak. And it would speak about the fact that our history is replete with seepages and leaks, and it was an opportunity to have that conversation. Um, and before I go to the creative uh, sort of cultural activism work, the last work I'll show in the art practice, which is here in the gallery, is this brand new series I'm working on. It's called Second Spring. Um, and it's talking about the shifting interior remains in the post-reproductive female body. This is a very new shift. Uh, it feels quite private, um, uh, but it is linked in some way, because, because these are on the ledger pages, it's also linked to this pressure to be productive. And it's exploring how women move into this uncharted territory following the generative stage of life. So I'm asking how do women deal with uh, invisibility, shifts in desire, hormonal readjustment levels, um, and androgynous states of being as you become older, um, what are our expectations as we age, um, and how do perceptions of beauty shift from one woman to another. And I think one of the challenges is that the way that we experience the post-reproductive moment is very often fixed within a patriarchal narrative that is grounded in misogyny. So there, there's a sense that we have anxiety or shame or judgment that we are no longer valuable to society when our capacity to reproduce wanes. So rather than thinking about the power of um, transitions, very often our own understanding or experience of this moment is grounded in these fixed negative notion that you're beyond your cell by date. 
So what this work is trying to look at is to contest this sort of fiction and to think more about our encounters as aging women with wildness, with intuition, with thresholds, with aligning ourselves to our spirit. Um, in this drawing, she's, which is, she's wearing a dress made of heart seed, the title, the collective title of the exhibition. And the heart seed is a slender climbing vine that you find on the roadsides. It has a small um, little pod, and in the pod is a black seed, a very tiny black seed with a white heart. It is popular with butterflies, and it's used for nesting material. Um, so there's this sense that she's um, moving into this uncharted territory, but thinking more from the perspective of the mystery of biology rather than uh, shame or anxiety and taking this leap of faith. So I'll transition now into my work as a cultural activist. In 2011, I founded uh, the Fresh Milk Art Platform, which operates also out of my studio. Um, it's managed by two people, me and Catherine Kennedy, with a number of kind of volunteers that come on intermittently. Um, the name is because we are located on a dairy farm, but it's also inspired by the fact that women turn their blood into milk to nurture their young. And so we are very much a platform for young and emerging artists. Again, it's inspired by the concept of phytoremediation. Um, so fresh milk is almost a plant that's intervened into the site of the plantation. And through its programming, it is trying to counter a historically closed and traumatic site for it to become an open space that values community, critical thinking, um, creative actions across gender, race, class, and nationality. And the belief is that if you change what happens on a site, you contribute to changing that site. Uh, that plantation was not built to do things like this. And uh, so this really pushes against that traumatic history. It includes um, the Colleen Lewis Reading Room, which has 3,000 books. Um, and like the collection here, classified according to the Dewey Decimal System. We have local, regional, and international programming. Um, uh, we have a local residency program. We've supported um, 20 local artists so far. And in doing that, we're validating the work of local practitioners. Uh, this is our public-facing gallery. It's called the Fresh Milk Art Board. And this has the work um, of David Gums, who's a St. Martin-based, uh, St. Martin-born uh, Martinique-based artist. We have an international residency program and have housed 43 artists from all over the world uh, since 2012. Those residencies require some form of community outreach. Um, the artist in the yellow shirt standing, Danilo Oliveira, is from Brazil, and very often they will speak about their practice to the students at Community College, where I used to teach. We have an interactive digital map of cultural spaces across the Caribbean from the um, mid-19th century. Uh, so we are showing that the Caribbean is a culturally active space. It is not a blank slate. So you can go through and search in terms of linguistic areas, institutions, um, educational spaces, artist-led initiatives. And then we've got two um, major projects that we run. So Holly Bino, my colleague, and Elvis Lopez, we co-founded Caribbean Linked, which is one of uh, several platforms that we are managing to future-proof art practice and the cultural environment of the region. It's hosted in Aruba at a space called Aten Atelier 89 that's run by Elvis Lopez. That's the oldest artist-led initiative in the Caribbean. Um, and it unites artists, young artists from all linguistic parts of the Caribbean. A lot of artists are quite lonely um, working in small kind of nation state spaces and their needs are very rarely being met. So the value of human interaction at these kinds of forums cannot be underestimated. Um, it, it, it's a space for young artists to come from the French, Spanish, Dutch, English, uh, Caribbean. So normally we have between 10 and 12 young artists, um, a visiting curator and a visiting writer. Um, 
in this in this case we had um, in 2016 our visiting curator was Pablo Leon de la Barra so we're bringing curators in to create visibility for the work that young artists are doing so that more opportunities can happen for them the last iteration was in 2018 and Miguel came to that he was the visiting curator for that particular iteration and it's such a powerful platform so we've worked now with almost 50 artists and what's happening is that these are forming really powerful um, collaborative groups of people who are continuing to stay in touch with each other to produce new projects with each other um, and it's a really fulfilling um, project that focuses on the making of work. And then the final project um, I'll talk about is Tilting Axis, which was co-founded in 2015 by Holly Bino and me. We hosted the first iteration in 2015 at Fresh Milk. We had about 35 people. And different to Caribbean Link, Tilting Axis is really about how do we make a healthy cultural ecosystem in the Caribbean? from our perspective most of the decisions about the caribbean are made external to the caribbean so the economic partnership agreement is controlled by the european union how do we make decisions about our space from our perspective and so the idea of tilting the axis is about shifting the world's gaze to look at the caribbean's contemporary visual art practice and to consider the work that we're doing and to, to think about this as a center rather than a periphery uh, our core team now comprises Mario Caro, Lise Ragbeer, Natalie Urquhart, and Tobias Ostrander. Our second iteration was in partnership with the Prez Art Museum at Miami. Um, Tobias was the chief curator there until very recently, and that our um, participation more than doubled. We had just over 70 people there. Um, and this is a growing forum to uh, and a strategy to address a lack of visibility and the realities of working in a multilingual archipelago. Uh, the third one was at the National Gallery of the Cayman Islands. Um, Miguel came to this and was part of the panel on curating the archive. Um, and again, what we're trying to do here is to link cultural workers um, so they feel as though they belong to this larger Caribbean, intra-Caribbean community, um, and to grow networks and to build collaborative transnational projects. This was the fourth iteration that happened in two cities in the Dominican Republic, in Santiago and Santo Domingo. Um, and what ends up happening is this platform is a kind of a, a cultural instigator space that's adding value to the arts ecology in the Caribbean, that's allowing us to tell our own stories from multiple centers um, and, and showing that an intra-regional uh, collaboration is the only way forward. We can't do this as a single person, entity, or state. The last one was held in May at the Memorial Act. It's the only slavery museum in the Caribbean. Um, this is in Guadeloupe, and we had just over 80 people attending. Uh, we are hoping that the sixth iteration will happen at the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas, depending on they've just been, as you know, terribly affected by Hurricane Dorian, so we're still waiting to see. And the final thing uh, that I'll share is that Tilting Axis has spawned a fellowship for emerging curators in the Caribbean. Um, there is no tertiary level training for curators in the Caribbean. So what we're trying to do is to form alliances with um, regional and international entities that can host Caribbean people. The first was Nicole Smythe Johnson. Uh, she is uh, from Jamaica. And uh, she spent some time moving through Scottish cultural institutions, and then she came to Barbados, Grenada, and Suriname. The research that she developed on this fellowship formed the basis of her PhD program, and she's now a PhD student at the University of Texas at Austin. Our second fellow was Natalie Willis. Her fellowship took place at the University of Texas at Austin, and that led to uh, an exhibition which opened last week. She works at the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas uh, in Nassau. 
The third is happening right now, just began this last week. Lisandro Suriel is from the Dutch island of St. Martin. He's the current fellow that arrived in Scotland this week, and he's spending a month with our partners, which includes the Glasgow School of Art, the University of St. Andrews, CCA Glasgow, Luck Scotland, Hospital Field, and Mother Tongue. And we have just recently announced our new fellowship. I've spent a year negotiating this fellowship with some of the top cultural institutions in the Netherlands, and I'm really excited about this. Our host institution is Het New Institute, which is located in Rotterdam. They're an institute that brings together architecture, digital platforms, and design. And our collaborators include the Amsterdam Museum, the Black Archives, Vit de Vit, and de Apple. It's a six-month fellowship with a 12,000 euro stipend. Um, and that is uh, open. The applications close on the 17th of November. That will happen from April till September of next year. So that's an amazing opportunity for a Caribbean. These are all for Caribbean-based people to contribute to their professional development. Um, in closing, I would just say that Fresh Milk, Tilting Axis, and Caribbean Linked, I see them as siblings that are born of the same mission, forged as profound commitments to small places, founding communities for what sometimes feels like orphaned artists who feel like there is no home to abide at or parent to provide nourishment. Collectively, these platforms are part of a larger cultural ecology comprised of many co-cartographers remapping small places to become more than the sum of their parts. Rather than accept what is an unequal global playing field, the collective unpacking of an art system and mutual reflection on shared difficulties allows communal critical in interrogation of our context to collectively imagine and work for other future sustainable possibilities. Thank you. Um, maybe my first question would be, um, after this great introduction to your work as an artist and cultural activist, um, I was wondering how do you define um, your relationship with writing and curating or curatorial practice because you I mean, you were doing this for, for our two decades now. So mm -hmm. how do you fit this um, in, your, yeah, in your work, as part of your work? Okay. With, with writing and curating. So I, you know, as I mentioned in the book, I, I never use the term curator. It feels like I'm squatting uh, uh, to use that term. Um, uh, and in a conversation with Bibi earlier this week, I was saying that I feel um, as a measure of self-preservation that um, the writing and the kind of activism and the art practice have to happen together because we live in spaces that are um, less than what we need. So we don't have an infrastructure, uh, you know, there isn't this infrastructure that, you know, with a, a wider cultural ecology where I can only be an artist. And so it feels as though the additional work of being a writer and an activist and an organizer um, is required. I mean, we don't have the privilege to choose one of those things because we're not in that fully functional kind of space. And, uh, you know, at one point I used to feel somewhat frustrated that these other things had to happen, but I actually now see it as an integrated part of the practice, which is empowering because it's shifting ground and it is another form of creation. Yeah. And maybe um, following that reflection, I think you were very involved in cultural activism. And, I, mean, I mean, creating these platforms and doing the management, which then takes a lot of time and energy and, of course, economic resources. So I was wondering how do you feel uh, now? Because I feel that you are now returning to your own work as an artist, that you're finally having some time uh, to yeah to, to, to your to your own creative practice and actually we as theoretic are very happy to to have the chance to show your your drawing so how do you feel this return to your drawings or to your practice it's the value of getting older <laughs> right because it means that um, there is a greater clarity and uh, so the decision to get back into the studio um, 
and to make a commitment to the practice well, that's also self-preservation because if I don't, if I don't do it, there's so many things that can induce madness in the Caribbean, and it's you know it's one of the things that I try to talk about in the book. It's the things that you love the most are the things that can drive you crazy. So loving small places, loving people that you're not supposed to love, loving a profession that you're there is no. I mean, I live in a country where there is no national art gallery, there is no contemporary art space. The insanity of choosing to be an artist in a place such as that uh, can send you crazy. So, um, and also for the first time in 24 years, uh, my children have left home and so I have the freedom to uh, rededicate and refocus and have, um, you know, more thought about my practice and it feels really, really good. <laughs> it feels really good and it's, it feels so special to be able to be showing this here well, as well because I also think that Virginia is someone who is um, juggling all of these things as well. So it feels like a really great space to do that. I really uh, love that you actually present the, the, the Tilting Axis platform alongside the Caribbean Link and the Fresh Milk because it gives us a, a better understanding of how these initiatives are working together. Mm -hmm. how are you, you said the word siblings, right? So yes. they are connected, yes. and for me personally, uh, visiting Tilting Axis was hugely important and made a, a, a very significant impact in the way I was thinking about the Caribbean. It was probably the same that when I moved to Costa Rica in 2015, I mean, I was working uh, mainly in South America, and I thought I had a, an, an understanding of Latin America, but when I actually, when I moved to, to Costa Rica, I understood that I was, uh, I was, I was, there were a number of things that I missed. And I feel the same when I actually had the chance to visit Grand Cayman Island and to, and right. to be part of this conversation with you all. And I think when uh, Paula and I had the chance to travel together uh, last year to Dominican Republic to be, to be part of the, of, of the, um, of the event, um, it was the same. And Paula and I returned to Theoretica with that question. Uh, what is our relationship with the Caribbean? I mean, and we, of course, we were aware of the of the work that Virginia was doing, um, but I think we needed to to frame the question in a different way now uh, because it's a different time. So I think um, doing this uh, publication with you was a great way, in, in my opinion, to move forward in that direction, right? And trying to address these kind of questions institutionally, mm -hmm. and maybe it's like a consequence of that, I'm, I'm, uh, I think, yeah, probably, but we are, as I mentioned it to you, uh, preparing an exhibition about Central American Caribbean right. art practices, and which is very challenging for us. Uh, but I think it's a very important challenge. Um, and I wanted to ask you, how do you feel about, about the book? How do you feel about when, do you remember the time that I, well, probably a couple of years ago, when I, when I told you that I was uh, with a desire of collect these writings uh, that you were doing and you started to organize your own archive and sending me materials and we're starting to exchange. And how do, you, how do you feel with the book? I mean, it's ready now, it's in your hands. <laughs> do you feel that um, there were some things that were missing in the book? Do you probably, you will, I mean, yeah, how do you feel about it? Part of the process, it was hell. And it's like drawing, it's really hard, right? Um, there, are a, there are a couple of pieces that I've thought about after, oh, forgot to share this with Miguel. Maybe this should have been something that could have been included. Um, but I feel, well, so privileged that this object exists. So I'm very, very honored to be the first Anglophone Caribbean artist and writer that's part of this really important series. Um, and I'd been saying for a couple of years, like, be careful what you wish for. I keep saying to Catherine, we need to write about the work we're doing. We have to write, we have to find somebody to write about this work we're doing. And then I had the opportunity to do that. Um, so for me, I think um, it also opens up a whole new network because it's a bilingual publication. So it's really interesting. Uh, as, as close as we are to Central America, there are also 
this impediment of language that we struggle with and we have struggled through the last two tilting access forums because there was the issues of translation. And so I think your commitment to having this in English and Spanish is, is fantastic. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to see where, where this is going to lead, but it's been a real privilege because the first text is from eight years ago. So it's also interesting to see these texts sitting next to each other and how things have shifted and uh, it forced me in the, in the new text on being committed to a small place to really try and wrap my head around what that commitment is. And it also opened up uh, new ideas about not just the second spring work but I'm particularly interested in ideas about miscegenation, and I and I think that has come through in the in the final piece. It's um, ideas I've wanted to write about for 30 years, but for you know reasons within my own family, I I couldn't, and it now feels like the the moment is here to do that. Uh, they haven't read it, but it's in there. Um, so yeah, it feels like a, an honor and a privilege, but a very good and rigorous exercise that was really tough at moments. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have come through the other side. Uh, are these copies, where, where did you get them from? That's one question. And the other question is about climate change or climate crisis, how, if there is a discussion amongst artists, Caribbean artists, mm -hmm. on the islands? Yeah. The ledger pages are um, connected to the place where I live, so there are ledger pages from that particular plantation and the place where I grew up. My father was a planter and we grew up on a suite of different plantations that he managed. So I had found these ledger pages in an abandoned bookkeeper's building and decided that I would work on them as a substrate because my interest in the plantation is, um, it meant that that was the perfect foundation for this work to happen because it then functions as a palimpsest. It's like this multi-layered uh, object that receives this information and these alternate images kind of uh, critique or speak back to that. So it provides a context for the work. Uh, in terms of climate change, uh, I mean, this is such a potent conversation that's happening right now. Uh, in particular, um, my closest colleague, Holly Bino, who is the chief curator at the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas, has just witnessed and been through uh, what happened in the Bahamas and it's been very interesting to see how that has transformed their work. So they have cancelled all of their end of year programming and they have set up a program called We Gotcha. And the We Gotcha program is a way to deal with um, post-traumatic stress disorder in relationship to Hurricane Dorian. Uh, as you may have noticed, her Dorian doesn't conform to the regular um, classification of hurricanes because the classification goes to number five, but we think that it could possibly be a seven or an eight. Um, as happened uh, a couple years ago with um, Maria and Irma, there was almost whole-scale evacuation of people from some small islands, one called Barbuda, where for the first time in 300 years there were no human beings on that island, and literally dogs were left to eat goats. And so what we are seeing in the Caribbean now and are speaking about a lot more, including our recently elected Prime Minister, Mia Motley, the first woman who is leading Barbados, is that we are on the front line of climate change, but we don't contribute to it. And um, the Bahamas is particularly vulnerable because it's at sea level. So what we've seen with Dorian there uh, a number of weeks ago is um, I don't even think we know what the death toll is. And it also demonstrates inequities in terms of class and race. So there was a migrant Haitian, Haitian Bahamian population on the island of Abaco. And that group of people they lived in a community called the MUD, M-U-D-D. -D. It no longer exists. Um, and we don't even know what the count is. Uh, 70,000 people have lost their homes. Thousands of people have moved to Nassau. And I think the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas is 
demonstrating as a best case practice cultural organization how to deal with that. Um, I know Puerto Rico had uh, a similar crisis and that there are cultural institutions like Beto Local, which Tiratica is working with, that has also been addressing that. Um, so that is an issue that we have to, I mean, it almost needs to be the most important issue. And I, I think that, you know, the issue of the plantation, which for me is interesting, it's something that Donna Haraway and Anna Singh speak about. There is a beautiful publication here in the Tiaratica Library by Donna Haraway called um, Staying with the Trouble. Staying with the Trouble. And they, they speak about this term, the plantationocene, and the plantationocene is part of the Anthropocene. And so I understand that very clearly because I can see it. You know, you come into this verdant island within 50 years, the entire bio bio biodiversity is almost eradicated. So it's, and, and also most of our oxygen comes from coral reefs, but our agricultural um, chemicals which go into the ocean, we're seeing the harsh reality of that. Our reefs are dying, um, our water table is polluted, uh, our decisions about development are always made on economics and we are thinking about the return of investment on economic capitalist models that no longer serve us and are absolutely killing us. Um, and I think that certainly has become very clear in the voice of one of the youngest global activists in the world right now, Greta Thunberg, who is addressing these issues very clearly. So I think that Yes, this conversation is happening among artists and writers in the Caribbean. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you. It is super, super, super inspiring. Um, I was curious about uh, Barbados' indigenous population because I have worked with Caribbean literature before, but not Barbados. So you mentioned you guys were looking for an enslaved village. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, uh, about the indigenous population in Barbados and like were slaves brought in or was the population like enslaved? Mm -hmm. And also I was curious because you mentioned the word cultural ecology, which is really interesting to me because I work with queer ecologies. Um, I wondered if you were familiar with that theoretical body because um, I was wondering through everything you said and it's super interesting to me as, as a vegan queer ecologist to think about the fact that you're in a, in a dairy farm. <laughs> and I'm very curious um, to know if like Caribbean artists engage with human and non-human uh, relationships in terms of non-human animals. So those were my two questions. Okay. And then I thought of a third one, like you're gonna run out of the ledger paper, right? <laughs> Have you thought about that? Our education is very incomplete. Um, you know, I was never told what the indigenous name of Barbados was as a child. It's Ichiruganum. It's not a term that we were taught of. The indigenous people generally in the Caribbean are written out or they're pathologized. So they exist um, as, you know, these historic objects and not living people. When the British arrived in uh, the early 17th century, the indigenous population were no longer there. Um, archaeologists have done research um, and they're not entirely sure why there's one idea that maybe there was an issue of water. Um, but there were indigenous people and this is evidenced of that. Um, and there are archaeologists that have done work on that so you are able to find um, these clay vessels that were stacked at, in a space where the fresh water met the seawater and there were you know, technologies that they developed to be able to gather water and so on. Um, there are islands in the Caribbean where there are indigenous populations that are living. Uh, um, and I think the voice of the contemporary indigenous practitioner is uh, something that I think is becoming louder, like globally. Um, but it's not something that's been spoken a lot about in the contemporary art space in the Caribbean. Your second question was um, uh, like the cultural ecology and relationship to queer ecology. I mean, we think about, we talk a lot in Tilting Axis about a healthy cultural ecosystem. Um, and so when we think about that, it's 
um, I guess it's in relation to a perceived lack and how do we think about what does it mean to have a healthy cultural ecosystem. And so when I look around at the artist-led initiatives, which are the entities with whom we're connected in spirit across the Caribbean, uh, we're all grappling with very similar things and it's, it's very much about a lack. Um, you know, people at the state level who are um, supposed to be enabling policy and writing legislation about things that they don't understand and the least equipped people who are actually blazing a trail and doing the work. So when I guess we think about a healthy cultural ecosystem, it's also about trying to bring um, diverse groups of people together to feel as though you are connected to something. Working in an archipelago is extremely challenging. Um, and so these annual encounters, um, when we were in Guadeloupe in May, I was trying to say there are no orphans here. This is our home, this is our tribe, this is what a healthy cultural ecosystem feels like, where people are committed to shifting ground and spending time together. So that's, I guess, how we think about it. It's about nurturing each other, um, uh, creating the space for, for cultural workers and artists and museum professionals and writers to come together. And that then is organically spawning these other kinds of projects. And then the last one about running out of the ledger page, I mean, I, I have hundreds and hundreds of these. Um, and maybe the work will evolve beyond that. Uh, so I don't know. I have to wait and see. <laughs> I was wondering how has the the monoculture of sugar like uh, how has influenced currently like today is it an issue already like is it an issue still because here in Costa Rica we had the um, the plantations in the Caribbean of bananas mm -hmm. and also coffee yes. of other in other places and it has actually created like an identity, like it's something sometimes Costa Ricans feel proud about, but we don't know a lot about it actually. So, um, and right now we have here the problem of the monoculture of pineapple. So I was wondering if in Barbados there's like something similar. I would say the monoculture of sugarcane. <clears throat> Recently our uh, prime minister was talking about if Hurricane Dorian had hit Miami uh, in the way that it hit the Bahamas, we would have been in real trouble because Miami is the space, it's, there's like a, the Miami is like a Caribbean hub, but it's also the space where a lot of stuff comes into the Caribbean. And we um, export what we produce and we import what we consume, right? So we are actually, most of what we eat comes from somewhere else. So if Miami was hit, we would have been real, in real trouble. So the issue of the monoculture means that the issue of food sovereignty is something that we have not addressed. We apparently in World War II, when ships were not allowed to come in, we were, uh, farmers were required to spend uh, to, um, uh, a per certain percentage of their um, fields had to grow food and so we were able to address it in a moment of crisis but generally and that also has to do with the tourist economy because we have um, you know part of our tourist industry has you know very wealthy people who have very particular taste and so we need to import particular kinds of foods to service that taste there are pockets of things that are changing. Interestingly, there is a quarry called Walkers, the same name as the farm where I live, um, and it was owned by the same person. And it's going through a regenerative phase at the moment where they're phasing out a 50-year-old sand quarry and they're turning it into a permaculture site and growing food out of sand. So there's this small, slow food movement that's starting, this small, organic um, food production movement that's happening, an increase in pride about things that are local, because there's also been a lot of shame connected to growing food and to working on the land because of the historical um, connections to enslavement and indentureship. Um, and so I think this issue of a monocrop, it's problematic in terms of biodiversity, in terms of food sovereignty, um, 
and yeah, it's not, we haven't actually addressed that properly. Um, I was thinking now that you were talking and you were answering uh, around the concept of sub sustainability. I think it's uh, quite related to what you were saying right now. Um, and I think uh, that we as independent art spaces or platforms, we are struggling all the time to keep our programs alive, to keep our, you know, to, to, to keep working the way we do. But uh, yeah, of course, and we can think sustainability in that sense, you know, what it means to be sustainable for an art institution. But we can also think this conversation in a different way, maybe to think how to make uh, an art practice that is also sustainable for the planet, right? Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, so I wanted to ask you about, about these two things, yeah. Fresh milk is a terrible example of <laughs> sustainability because, I mean, we were talking earlier this week about not connecting planetary exhaustion to human exhaustion in the contemporary art field, right? So as cultural workers, there is so much exhaustion, and I recognize it with my peers all over the Caribbean and internationally that there's this, an artist in particular seem to feel guilty if they're not working at any time during the course of the day or night. So there's this commitment to production, but it functions outside of every other kind of particular economic system. It doesn't conform to any other model that makes sense and we're all sort of making it up as we go along in some cases in the global south we're trying to aspire to models in the in the global north that absolutely don't fit um, we have uh, ministers of culture that are speaking about the percentage of gdp that culture gives towards societies in england and the u.s but they're not speaking about the uh, relation between contributions to cultural systems so fresh milk is has been going through a kind of an existential crisis for a number of time to a number of years to really consider how do we actually keep afloat. And I think in speaking with Paula, there's also this sense of shame about speaking about the mechanisms of how, of labor in the art field. Um, Hyperallergic, Harag Vartanian recently had a conversation about art handlers and the shame of art handlers in institutions like huge reputable institutions in the United States and how, how art handlers are treated. So there's this whole underbelly of labor that we don't necessarily talk about. Um, and I, I mean, we don't have answers for it because we're struggling, you know, we've now decided, okay, we've hosted 63 resident artists. We have managed five issues of Tilting Access that has hosted hundreds of people. Caribbean Linked has hosted like 50 artists. We've had countless kinds of programs. Uh, we're, you know, putting on these curatorial fellowships and almost all of it is on volunteer labor. 95% uh, of that is all volunteer labor. And, and this is the thing about being committed to a small place. There is insanity in that, right? Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know how do we think about that in sustainable ways. I mean, I think we just have to keep agitating our leaders and corporate social responsibility, which really thinks more about sports than arts. And we haven't found a model. Um, you know, one of the questions was, well, do we close? Does fresh milk need to last forever? Have we done enough? Do we shut fresh milk down and then we just commit to Caribbean linked and tilting access? Um, and then there's all the guilt and shame that surrounds those questions. Um, and, and hopefully, uh, in some of the conversations we've been having, maybe we can have this joined up conversation with all of our colleagues across the Caribbean so that we create a safe space for the kind of trauma and shame that we feel around cultural work. So I don't have a kind of a tidy answer for that. Annalie, I noticed that at least two people that asked questions talked about the ledger pages. Mm -hmm. um, and coming from Barbados as you do, I know there are two types of ledger pages, really. Uh, the one you show is the playlist. The other is the, is the one that really relates back to slavery, where the ledger page was the list of the slaves, maybe their name, their weight, and their value. 
And I just wonder when you, when you, when you conceptualize what you were doing, um, whether there was any thought pro process about the type of ledger page you would use, or was it just that you came across these and felt it was appropriate for, for what you were doing? So the ledger pages that I'm working with are the ones that I found and can use. They also, in one of the drawings in the gallery across the road, um, has in gangs of labor. And that's a classification system that continu you know, continued up until the 80s. So gangs of men, lab gang A, gang B. Uh, you know, so I was kind of interested in the classification and what was available. The ledger pages that would list the enslaved, I only have access to digitally. And I've been able to find um, the ledgers that name the enslaved at Walkers in 1834. Those, that data exists in London. Um, it has come into visibility through Catherine Hall, the wife of Stuart Hall, who developed cultural studies as a field in her research on empire. Um, and so that, that find has influenced a proposal for a project to um, recognize uh, the labor at Walker's. So that's pending, that particular project is pending funding at the moment. But it is something that I'm going to work with um, to uh, have a kind of a memorial to that, to that labor. Yeah, I was wondering what do you think about the work of cooking sections? Cooking sections are brilliant, I think. I first met them when they actually came to do a residency at Fresh Milk. And at that time, they were looking at their their work through the Empire Remain shop was developing through that residency and I worked with them to develop a Caribbean travel so that they could meet other people in the Caribbean. And I guess you maybe you know about the project the Empire Remain shop where they're talking about how the world is globalized according to food. Um, I, I think that they're very critical thinkers, they're great speakers, I think they're doing really important work. Um, and I was I felt very privileged to have been part of that Empire Remain shop project. Um, so yeah, I think they're, they're certainly people to watch. Uh, they're getting a lot of visibility in their work now around the world, and I, I, I kind of respect what they're doing. Um, maybe I, I have one last question, uh, and it's related to Tilting Axis. Um, how do you evaluate these five years, and, and how do you see the future of the of the of the project? Um, do you see Tilting Axis like growing, expanding? Um, what what are the next uh, iterations? I mean, again, you know, one of the issues around around that growth is is trying to see whether we can uh, find funding to support a secretariat for that. The labor around developing an annual meeting of 80 people is uh, no, no mean task. It's huge. And of course, it's also working transnationally. And um, the programming is, the programming this year was incredible. It was very, very solid. It was about um, the notions of decoloniality in relation to art criticism. Um, and the content was so solid. Um, and what feeds us, of course, you know, we start working on it, and just as we're going into it, I just think that we're all going to shoot ourselves because it's like ridiculous. And then we get there, and it's this incredible tonic that feeds us for a long time. And um, those spaces are like nutrition, and we need to keep them going. Um, the Fellowships have become a really powerful platform. And it's interesting to me that these international spaces want to partner with us. And I feel in some way that maybe contemporary Caribbean production is, you know, visibility is certainly increasing. Part of that is because, especially in the US, uh, Caribbean diasporic people are now in positions of leadership. So you're finding a lot of Caribbean people that are heading up organizations, and uh, they feel isolated, especially if they're Afro-American people who feel quite isolated in the professional field, m more they move up in their positions. And so Tilting Access has become a space for them to reconnect with the Caribbean. So I think it's, 
it's working in both in the diaspora and the Caribbean. Um, my commitment always is to the Caribbean, and it's trying to figure out how to keep that balance healthy. It's not designed exclusively for the diaspora. It's really to create space for those working in the Caribbean. So hopefully, we, you know, the core team is a solid group of people, and hopefully we're going to be able to figure out a way to find sustainability. I mean, that, that's the big issue for everything, sustainability. You are very welcome to visit the exhibition Harseed by Anna Lee. Estamos invitados a ver la exposición que inauguramos al frente. Vamos a tener que usar los paraguas para poder cruzar. Bueno, muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Anali. Thank you.